Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar, entitled Introduction to FTIR Spectroscopy, Theory and Applications. My name is Sarah Thomas, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Fauzi Abu Shaheen, Resident Spectroscopist at SPECAC. Today, Fauzi will provide a concise explanation of infrared spectroscopy, highlighting how transmission and ATR techniques are used in FTIR spectroscopy for the analysis of liquid and solid samples. Just before I hand over to our speaker, I would like to mention a couple of things. Please feel free to ask any questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. You can view the presentation in full screen by clicking on the tab at the bottom right of the media window player. And the on-demand link will also be provided for this webinar a few days later. Without further delay, I would like to hand over to Fauzi, and I would like to thank him for presenting to us today. Please go ahead, Fauzi. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, welcome to this webinar. This will be an introduction um, to FTIR spectroscopy, as well as talking about some theory, and uh, the focus will be on the applications uh, that you can use using this technique. So I'll start off by introducing the infrared region of uh, the spectrum and mainly in, in, be talking about the mid-infrared and that's the region where molecules vibrate and we get a lot of information about the chemical makeup of samples. For instance, cocaine and sugar are very similar looking white crystals and they absorb similar amounts of visible light but they uh, absorb different amounts of infrared light and we can use that information to distinguish uh, the two samples. So that's just one example of the types of applications that we can use uh, spectroscopy for, and I'll name a few others, as well as talk about the different techniques such as transmission and reflectance. And solids and liquids will be the main focus, but I'll uh, allude to some of the gas spectroscopy techniques that you can use. And at the end, uh, if you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask them. So Let's start off with something quite basic, as I'm sure you already know. Light is split into different colors, and this is true for the whole spectrum. On the right, uh, where we have the lovely rainbow-colored part of the spectrum, that's the visible range, and we have a blue end and a red end of different wavelengths, starting from 0.2 up to 0.8 micrometers. As you go with longer wavelengths, uh, you start into the infrared region up until 1,000 uh, micrometers, and that is the region where molecules vibrate. So when we use infrared spectroscopy, we're looking for those uh, chemical signatures to determine uh, what we have in our solution or in our solid. So just to make sure that we all know what a wavelength is, I'm sure we do, it's the distance between uh, one peak and another in a wave. So in this example here, the wavelength is 2,000 micrometers. But when it comes to infrared spectroscopy, it's quite conventional to use a different metric, and that is the wave number. So that's the distance, that's the number of waves you can fit into one centimeter. So in this example here, you can fit five of those waves in one centimeter. So we'd refer to that uh, wave as having a wave number of five reciprocal centimeters. And I will use wave numbers uh, throughout the rest of the talk as it's quite conventional. So the infrared spectrum is a relatively low energy part of light and it's mainly used to look at vibrations as I mentioned. There are two important factors you need to consider before you're ready to record your spectra. And the most basic question to ask is how do I hold my sample? And that depends if your sample is a liquid or a paste or a gel or is it a gas. And there are different um, techniques to analyze different samples. So if you had um, a generic fluid, then the most common uh, tool to use would be a cuvette, which is um, shown in the middle. But if you have, say, uh, a particular type of liquid that you don't have much of, or it's, um, there's not a lot of volume, you'd use a more specialized variable path length cell, 
Similarly, if you have a gas and you can use a gas cell and they're, they're shown at the ends there. The nice thing about these uh, tools is that they're quite customizable. If you are going to study gases outside, then you might want a stainless steel gas cell rather than a glass one in case it breaks or in case you have to transport it distances. So it's very nice that we can um, use more than just one tool. And I'll show you some of the more modern techniques later on. So after you've decided what tool you need um, and what you want, you also have to consider what part of the, um, what material the windows uh, you use need to be. So on the, on the slide below, we have several types of uh, crystals or window materials you can use. Zinc, zinc selenide, for instance, is perfect for uh, recording spectra in the mid-infrared. That's where it's most transparent. Whereas if you're using um, calcium fluoride, you'd mainly focus on UV vis applications because that's where it's transparent. And if you have something quite chemically aggressive, like uh, some acid or caustic soda, then you can also use uh, optical diamond, which is more resistant than the other two materials. So there is a, a lot of choice for the modern spectroscopist. Once you've decided on the holder uh, that you want to use, you're ready to go once you've loaded your sample. You place your cuvette, for instance, into your spectrometer, and the spectrometer will fire a broad pulse of light, various wavelengths with a known starting intensity, and that will be called I0. Once uh, the light passes through the sample, that sample will absorb varying amounts of light at different wavelengths and the output we will have an intensity called i and it's the ratio between those two intensities that the detector will detect and give us a value of our absorbance there's a very well uh, known equation that um, we need to consider and that's on the screen a is equal to e c and l now e or epsilon is the absorption coefficient. This is a very important uh, property of the material. It's unique to each individual molecule, but we can consider it as a constant. So it doesn't change um, if you're doing your experiments at the same room temperature and pressure. So we won't focus on that parameter in this webinar, but the other two are quite important because we can alter them. So C is the concentration, and of course, we can change the concentration of our samples just by adding more or taking away uh, to decrease it. And that will affect the absorbance uh, in a very intuitive way. If you consider your morning coffee, then as you add more coffee grounds, the liquid gets darker. As you add more water, it gets lighter. And that's because the sample is absorbing different amount of visible light. The same uh, thing occurs for infrared. And L is the path length, that is the distance the light has to travel through your sample. And as it increases, then there will be more molecules absorbing more light. So the detector will register that as an increase in absorbance. So let's look at um, a couple of real applications um, where concentration and the path length can be changed to affect the absorbance. So um, here's an example of spectroscopy where um, there's a direct application. The quantity of lactose in dairy milk varies depending on a cow's health and how far she is uh, in a pregnancy. So the dairy industry like to monitor the lactose levels in their milk samples. Here is the absorption spectrum of a solution of 4% lactose. And you can see that there is uh, an absorption occurring centered around uh, 14 wave, 1,400 wave numbers and a much stronger absorption centered around 1050 wave numbers. And those, um, are, that's the signature that we get from the lactose at a 4% solution. So if we focus at the peak at 1040, then the absorbance is 0.2. But if we now increase the concentration of the solution to 6%, we've noticed that the 
absorption band has increased in intensity. It's a very uh, simple explanation. That's because there's now more lactose in the solution, so more of it is absorbing. So the absorbance at that same peak has increased to 0.25. And if we repeat this process to an, an 8% and a 10% solution, then we continue to increase the absorption to 0.3 and 0.4 respectively. What we can then do is plot the increase in absorbance relative to the change in the lactose concentration, and, al and this allows us to develop a calibration curve. This is um, a very important and useful tool that a lot of spectroscopists use to quickly identify the percentage concentration of not just lactose, but anything, whether it's fats, acids, or sugars, uh, in a solution. Because if you take an unknown sample now and record the absorbance at a particular wavelength, then you can use this calibration plot to determine the percentage of lactose in your solution. So it's very important and very efficient if you imagine a farmer has hundreds of milk samples they want to analyze. It's, it's a lot easier once you've developed a calibration curve. So... I hope I've uh, demonstrated to you the importance of uh, you know, making sure your concentration is accurate once you analyze your sample. The path length is uh, just as important um, because that also affects the absorbance. And in this graph, we have um, the absorption spectrum of some motor oil I recorded uh, using two different path lengths. So in blue, uh, the path length is 100 micrometers, and in black, the path length was four times smaller, 25 micrometers. And what you'll notice is that it doesn't matter which peak you look at, the difference in intensity is always a factor of four, and, and that is because there's a linear relationship between path length and absorbance. But you might ask, why would I want to change the path length? Well, sometimes you need to know the exact position of a peak. And if we look at the peak at 1500 wave numbers, um, you'll see that it's not a smooth or sharp peak. It's actually quite noisy and we can't determine the center of that because it's not well resolved. Simply, the absorbance of that peak is too strong for the detector to handle. In instances like this, we would want to reduce the path length rather than the concentration so that we have a less intense absorption band. And what you can clearly see in the black trace is that the shorter path length has allowed us to better resolve that absorption band. And now I can see where the center of the peak is at just under 1500 wave numbers. Okay, so I guess the next question is, I know how to change the concentration, that's pretty simple, but how do I change the path length? So if you're using a cuvette, then You've already got a fixed path length, so you'd have to get lots of different uh, cubettes in order to change the path length. That's a little impractical. You can imagine you'd end up with hundreds of different cubettes. Um, also, the choice of path length is rather limited uh, in a cubette. So the alternative is to use a variable path length cell. And uh, on the screen, you have perhaps the standard uh, traditional liquid cell. It's easy to take apart, and what you have, in essence, is two windows separated by a thin piece of plastic, and that is the spacer which determines your path length, and you place your liquid inside. And these bits of plastic are great. You know, they're easy to make. They're non-reactive, so you can have all sorts of solutions inside, whether it's acidic or aggressive, and you can change the thickness quite easily whether it's 0.1 micrometers up to two, three, five millimeters. It's really simple. But it is a little fiddly, and it does take some time and training to, uh, to make a cell that doesn't leak. And it's also difficult to load lots of viscous samples, like oils. Greases are definitely out of the question. So between this and the cuvette, there's you know, some room for improvement. And uh, we definitely need a, a better approach. And that's 
what I'm going to show on this slide. An alternative approach is to use um, a rather newly developed liquid cell, and that's called the pearl. And this is a similar idea to the liquid cell in that it contains a window, but it's horizontal this time. And that allows the user to easily load their viscous liquids or runny solvents or whatever sample they have, even greases, onto the window and then place a top window to act like a cell sandwich and then you've got your sample ready to be analyzed. And you don't even need much of your sample, so on the order of microliters, unlike, say, a cuvette where you need quite a few milliliters of your sample, the loading process and the cleaning up process is really fast. So if you imagine you've got lots of students all wanting to analyze their liquid samples, with the Perl, it's a fantastically fast way of doing that. But with the more traditional methods, like the liquid cells and the cuvettes, it would take a lot longer. So let's see an example of the kind of spectra that you can record. So here are two spectra of different oils. So oil companies like BP or Shell will want to use um, spectroscopy to determine whether their oil's new or contain some contaminant, um, has it been oxidized? And in the black spectrum, I've got some fresh motor oil and there are some uh, quite clear peaks. For instance, the ones at 1350 wave numbers and just under 1500. But if you take that oil and put it in a motor for 18 months, then you would expect uh, it to be chemically degraded slightly. And that's what the red spectrum is. It's just a bit of used oil. And I've compared the two, and you can see that for the most part, the spectra look the same, but there are some new, new features that weren't previously there. So around 1200, we see signs of sulfation. And around 1600, there's evidence of oxidation and even nitration in the oil. And that's just um, a clear indication that the, the oil has been changed chemically. So... Clearly, infrared spectroscopy is a very useful tool to not just determine the concentration, but also to determine whether our samples are new or chemically different. And this has a lot of applications, as I'll show later on, not just for liquids, but also for solids. It's a very versatile and powerful tool. Another benefit of um, this new uh, technique for analyzing liquids is that the windows are slightly wedged. And what you can occasionally get with the more traditional parallel windows is a fringing pattern. And that's just a consequence of the refractive index of the material uh, of the window. So in the red trace, we can just about see some absorption bands, but there's a really annoying fringing pattern uh, which is masking a lot of the signals that we want to detect. So in the blue spectrum, it's the same sample, but recorded using wedged windows in the pearl. This time we can detect and resolve the absorption band at, say, 1,000 wave numbers or 1,750. So that's just another advantage. Um, you can eliminate annoying fringe patterns, um, which occur mainly at short path lengths. So um, if you want to um, if you want to analyze liquids, there's um, you know a variety of different options available for you, which is great. Um, but by far, um, a modern spectroscopist will want to use something that's user friendly, um, easy to uh, clean and fast, with controllable path lengths, and can handle a range of samples like liquids and greases, as well as pastes that you just can't do with the more traditional means. Um, the traditional tools that a spectroscopist used to use. So that's pretty much the basics of uh, liquid analysis. Um, the next couple of slides will talk about how we would go about analyzing solid samples. So if you want to record uh, spectroscopic measurements of solids, a different approach is needed and by far, the most well-known technique is making a potassium bromide disc, or KBR. And traditionally, you just take some of your sample, such as an organic product like ibuprofen, and grind that down into a really fine powder. And then you add the KBR, the potassium bromide. Uh, 
once you've ground them together, you want a roughly 10 to 90% ratio of your organic sample to potassium bromide. And then you press the powder into a pellet with a mechanical press or a manual press. And when you form this disc, then you can place that into the spectrometer. And what you essentially have is your, your organic sample trapped within a KBR matrix. And the potassium bromide is transparent. So all the infrared light sees is your organic sample. And a spectrum of the ibuprofen I recorded using this technique is shown, you know, and it's very clear and it's, it is reliable. But there are some downsides with this. And mainly, it's just it takes too long. Um, I remember as an organic chemistry student at UCL, we used to queue up, not just in the lab, but right outside uh, towards the coffee shop, just all loads of students trying to make these discs, and it just takes forever because there's only one press. So there are some disadvantages. Another one is that, you know, you can't analyze wet, wet solids. If there's uh, a leaf, for instance, you want to uh, check, um, any moisture would damage the KBR disc, so it's not great for um, a variety of different samples unless it's just a fine powder. So an alternative uh, technique to use, therefore, um, is needed, and a recent development is the attenuated total reflectance technique, or ATR for short, and it's quite simple. An ATR is um, where you have incident infrared light coming from your spectrometer and that is directed towards a crystal that is transparent in the wave in that wavelength range so in the infrared like zinc selenide or diamond classic examples the infrared light is then internally reflected within the crystal and heads back towards the detector in the same way that the transmission uh, equipment we're using the key difference however is that at the point of reflection there is a small amount of light that is leaked through uh, from the crystal. This is a quantum mechanical effect that we won't really go into, but it's enough for you to know that there is this small amount of light, and we can use that to um, analyze the spectrum of our sample simply by placing um, it onto the crystal. And I'll show you what a, a typical tool looks like so here we have um, the Quest ATR, and all you need to do is drop a couple of microliters or just a couple of milligrams, if it's a liquid or a solid, onto um, the crystal, and that's in the center of the metallic shiny puck there. And there's no sample preparation, unlike in the KBR method, so it really is a very useful tool. And I'll talk about the different crystals uh, later on that you can have. There is some uh, element of customizability, and that is because different crystals will have different refractive indices, and that will change the amount of light penetrating into your sample. But before I go on to that, I'll just demonstrate an example of the kind of spectra you can record. So in black, I've got the absorption spectrum of ibuprofen recorded using the KBR disc technique, the very traditional way. And in blue, I've got the same sample, but the spectrum was recorded using the ATR technique. And what's very clear is that the features are exactly the same, the relative intensities of the bands are the same, and there's practically no difference. If we focus in on the lower wave number side, typically called the fingerprint region, where large organic and uh, pharmaceutical molecules are typically um, investigated with more scrutiny, we can see again that the absorption bands are pretty much identical. There is a subtle difference, however, in that the baseline for the spectrum recorded with the ATR is a lot more flat than that recorded with the potassium bromide. And that's because um, the moisture in the atmosphere and in the potassium bromide um, is affecting the quality of the spectrum, whereas moisture and water content don't affect ATR measurements. So that's just another example why uh, the ATR is a superior uh, technique. 
so another example to demonstrate is um, when you want to compare solids that are not so easy to grind. So if you have three different leathers, for instance, that's quite a difficult material to cut up and grind into a potassium bromide disc, then how else would you use it? Would you use the ATR? And here are three different leathers, so suede, nubuck, and aniline dyed leather that the University of Northampton recorded using the Quest. And it's a very fast way of just recording your spectra. As I say, no sample preparation is needed. You just place your leather on top, press go on the computer. It's as simple as that. And if you have hundreds of these samples to record, rather than do it in, in hours using the traditional way, you know, now there's a faster and better technique. So I mentioned that the light in the ATR is internally reflected within a crystal and that some of the light leaks, and that leak light is effectively our path length. If you remember, a path length is the amount, is the distance the light travels through your sample. Okay, so in the ATR, the light doesn't pass completely through, it just penetrates the surface. Um, but it's the refractive index of your crystal material which determines the path length. So here's a table indicating the depth of light penetration, DP, for different ATR crystals, as well as how transparent they are in the infrared. So on the whole, these three different crystal materials have very similar uh, properties with subtle differences. So zinc selenide at the top is what I refer to as a general use crystal. It's pretty good for most materials, um, has a very broad transparency in the infrared, and it gives us a, a nice short um, path length of around two micrometers. But if you want to analyze something quite acidic or uh, alkali, then diamond would be um, a better choice because it's chemically more resistant. Interestingly, the refractive indices of zinc selenide and diamond are pretty much identical. And that means that the path length you get with one and the other are the same. Conversely, with germanium, the refractive index is a lot higher, and that uh, means that the amount of light leaking when there's an internal reflection is less. So we effectively get a shorter path length. And this is ideal if you have really concentrated samples or the absorption of your sample is just too strong, so you'd want to reduce your path length. Um, so that is just another way where the, another example why the ATR is a superior technique because there's a lot more customizability for the user and that's quite an important tool when you've got a variety of different samples you want to analyze. Okay, so that really brings us to the end of this webinar on the basics of infrared spectroscopy and um, you know some of the accessories that you can use uh, for your analysis. Infrared spectroscopy, as I mentioned, um, is uh, used for a broad range of applications, ranging from checking your motor oil to quality checking of chocolates or lactose in milk, or if you want to compare different leathers, it's really versatile as a technique. And um, during my experience as a spectroscopist and researcher, um, I've seen spectroscopy used in a very diverse range of fields. So it's, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a grease, a powder, or a liquid, or a bulk solid. There are accessories available to analyze all of those types. It's a shame I didn't have time to um, discuss gases in great detail in this webinar, but of course you can analyze them spectroscopically, and you can analyze uh, gases with um, a variety of different path lengths as well. There's a wide choice because their concentrations are a lot less. So when it comes to the ATR, though, um, it's very fast, user-friendly, and perfect for qualitative and quantitative data. But its real um, feature is that it offers short path lengths, and that's great. Um, if you have liquids that you need anal analyzing um, with a reproducible path length, uh, it's perfect to use the pearl because it's offering a new way of analyzing liquids that's faster, easier, more reliable, and requires less user training. So these are just modern techniques for uh, the modern spectroscopist.
So I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have either online here or offline if you emailed them to me. You've got my contact details on screen and I'm also going to be in a range of different trade shows and conferences and so feel free to bump into me there. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Fauzi, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. So now let's move on to the final part of today's webinar, the question and answer session. So for the first question, how would you choose the material of the windows? Um, thanks, Sarah. Well, um, you want to eliminate the absorbance from the background uh, environment, and that includes the air, um, but also the windows. So that's why you want to include a window that is transparent. So if you want to uh, look at vibrations in the infrared, you choose a material like zinc selenide because that's quite transparent. Similarly, if you want to go into uh, looking at electronic, vibra uh, electronic transitions in the visible and UV, you choose um, a different material like calcium fluoride, which is transparent. So you need to um, know what region of the spectrum you're looking at. Great, thanks, Fauzi. Um, we have another question that's come in. Uh, is it possible to see nanoparticle vibration? So you can. Um, of course, it depends a little on the concentration. Some um, nanoparticles, uh, such as um, quantum dots, can be hard to stay in solution, so you need to be a little careful. Um, a lot of uh, UV vis work is done with nanoparticles because the band gaps are large enough that they absorb um, in the UV vis region. Similarly, uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with things like carbon nanotubes, then you can um, have additional uh, carboxylic acid groups attached to them and uh, put derivatives on the nanotube to see those absorption peaks, and that's how you would quantify uh, things like nanotubes. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question. What does it mean for an absorption peak to be resolved or saturated? Well, um, an absorption peak um, is resolved if you can uh, detect the peak center, especially if it's sharp, um, or if the bands are clear um, and there's a good resolution in your spectrum. So um, that's how you'd know that it's resolved. Great, thank you. We have another question. Uh, in your opinion, what is the best way to analyze viscous and volatile adhesives? So with uh, viscous materials, um, ATR is quite good, but um, it can be a little hard to clean. Uh, so you have to be careful with your, your solvents, but um, the pearl is also quite useful for that, um, unlike uh, other uh, accessories. When, you, when you've got volatile samples, you can also use uh, the ATR, but you need to have uh, a good seal around the solvent uh, so that it doesn't evaporate into the environment and uh, ruin your detector or cause some signal that's false. Great, thank you. Um, another question? So how do you select a suitable peak for a calibration curve? Can it be better to use a small, well-resolved peak on the shoulder of a larger one, for example? So you want to pick a peak that is uh, well-resolved um, at a broad range of concentrations. So you can get um, a lot of uh, meaningful, uh, statistically meaningful data points. So you want uh, a peak that you can observe at high concentration and low concentration in order to see the absorption change with concentration. Uh, a small shoulder um, can be good um, if it's not uh, completely masked by a more dominant peak at higher concentration. Great, thanks, Fauzi. Uh, another question. When would you use a long path length and when would you prefer a short path length? So you would use a, a long path length um, if the concentration that you wanted to analyze is quite small, um, especially if it's uh, not a concentration you can increase easily. 
Um, for instance, if you wanted to analyze the uh, ozone uh, in the atmosphere, it's not always uh, easy to change that concentration. So you'd use a long path length gas cell. Uh, similarly, if you have a, a very intense uh, concentration that um, you it will just absorb too strongly and saturate the detector, a shorter path length, um, like you, on the order of two or three micrometers would be more suitable. Great, thanks, Palsy. Um, we have another question. Uh, can nanoparticle be analyzed in FTIR since no covalent bond vibrations can be measured? So, um, as I mentioned uh, to a previous question earlier, yes, you, you can, and it depends on the kind of nanoparticles you're, you're looking at. Um, with functionalized uh, nanoparticles, you're detecting the functional group. Uh, so it depends on whether those vibrations are present in the infrared. You also need to make sure that um, the nanoparticle is not sticking to each other or coagulating, and that will give you a false reading. Typically, when you coat your nanoparticles with some uh, protective layer with a shell, then you can use that the vibrations of those uh, linker molecules to, to measure the concentration of your, your particles. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Can we use FTIR spectroscopy to quantify carbon nanoparticles from plant tissues? Um, if you extract, uh, so carbon nanoparticles seem to be quite popular today. Um, if you extract these uh, particles from plant tissue and are able to separate them, then you might be able to, to do that. You It's possible that so other, other contaminants, um, like some chlorophylls, um, it would be an interesting experiment, to say the least. Thank you. Uh, I have another question. Uh, when you say path length, is that the thickness of the sample? Yes, it is for transmission um, spectroscopy. So when you're using the pearl, for instance, or liquid cells, then the path length will be the, the gap between the front window and the rear window because the, the solution will fill that volume. When you're looking at surface measurements like the ATR, the path length will be the amount of the amount uh, the light will penetrate through the, the sample. So usually that's a surface measurement. So yes, the path length is the thickness of the sample, but when it comes to uh, ATR uh, measurements, then the path length is the amount of light that penetrates through the sample. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Could you comment on solvents for dilution if you want to limit background? Well, um, the solvents, um, it depends a little on where, um, on what band that you're looking at. So carbon tetrachloride, for instance, is um, a very good solvent because it's quite clear um, in a lot of the mid-infrared. Of course, it's quite toxic, so you have to be careful with that. Um, so you have to choose the appropriate solvent um, so that it's, it's giving you um, no absorption bands um, for the, the, the property you're looking for. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, what is the main difference of using ATR or the pearl accessory? So that's a very good question. The, um, the ATR is a very useful and reliable uh, accessory, especially when you want to look at um, powders and solids, which the pearl um, doesn't uh, uh, help you with, because that's mainly used for liquids. Um, the ATR also allows you to look at um, absorption spectra um, where your concentration is very high or if you really want a low path length, because the path length you get with an ATR is on the order of four to five micrometers, whereas with the Pearl, you do have a lot more flexibility. You can go up from 25 micrometers all the way up to a millimeter. So the main difference is in the path length that you can get. Great. Another question. Uh, using an ATR, does it matter 
um, about the amount of material loaded onto the window. Um, so another very good question. Actually, the amount you load onto the ATR crystal does and doesn't matter. It depends on the amount. So let me clarify that. If you're looking at um, some uh, powder, then the light will typically just penetrate through the surface on the order of a couple of micrometers. So provided that your, your sample is thicker than that path length, then you won't see the substrate, for instance, if you've got a thin film on, uh, on a glass substrate. So you, you really are just looking at surface measurements rather than bulk properties. Great, thank you. Um, have another question. So what is the most viscous grease or paste that you have analysed with the pearl? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, what is the most viscous grease or paste that you have analysed with the pearl? So the most uh, viscous uh, paste or grease I've, I've used with the pearl personally is, uh, is honey. Um, that can be uh, a little tricky to do, but you can warm it up and it becomes slightly less viscous. Uh, chocolate actually was um, was quite a favourite of mine. Um, you can you can analyse that. It does uh, freeze at room temperature, um, so it, the windows do stick, but they also come off quite easily and are easy to clean. So it's quite a versatile tool. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. So, can a diamond crystal be damaged? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, diamond is uh, notoriously very tough, um, unless, of course, you're scratching it with another diamond. Um, certainly with the, the, the diamond in the quest, um, it's very resistant chemically, um, so you shouldn't be getting any damage um, by adding, say, acids. Um, so it really does depend on the application. Of course, as you go to very higher temperatures, um, there might be uh, some wear over use, but um, yeah, that person is very welcome to ask me directly what their application is, and I can answer hopefully more, more clearly. Great. Thank you very much, Fauzi. Uh, so while that's all we have time for today, thank you very much for today's informative uh, discussion and presentation, and thank you to everyone joining us online and for your interesting questions. I hope that you found the session worthwhile. If we didn't manage to answer your question, please feel free to email me at sarah at selectscience.net, and I will follow up with your questions for Fauzi personally. If you would like to listen again to today's webinar or to invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in a few days' time. So goodbye and thank you once again for joining us. Goodbye.